All right, I think you're probably all getting a recording message. I'm starting the recording now. My uh, plan is to uh, give this to Rob so you guys can do whatever Rob wants with it. So, <clears throat> so uh, you should be aware about me that um, after 10 years as a corporate trainer, um, I tend to use the chat when I teach, so I will put things in there. I will also read what's in there, uh, and if you want to respond or you know engage in dialogue that way rather than verbally, awesome. Okay, totally works. This presentation, uh, so I've I've taught this stuff. Um. Oh, I guess I should tell you something else. Hold on. Did I copy the link? I did. So um, starting next week, apparently, I am the, I don't even have a title yet. Um, I'm going to be like a sort of, um, I think, resident chief writing coach or something at the Apex Writers Group. So... Um, I don't actually know all the dimensions of what Apex offers, but if you've ever thought I might want to check that out, um, that is a place that I think you'll be able to find me at least every week. Uh, and uh, there's a link in the chat if you want to look at it. So um, this is a subject I've talked about at several different events now. And this slide deck is the three-hour version. Okay, now, it, when I have delivered this over three hours, it's been like a, at a deliberate, slow, conversational pace. Let's talk through all of this stuff. Let's look at examples together. My intent is not to have, go for three hours tonight. Um, I will get in trouble if I go for three hours tonight. My intent is to try to do it with something like an hour and a half. So I, I may sort of move a little faster through some of these slides and I may sort of say things and, and where in a, in a, in, with more time, I might've wanted to dialogue point by point through a slide. I may just kind of show it to you and make the point. Okay. So my goal, I'm thinking 90 minutes. Does that seem reasonable to people? Yep. Okay, cool. Obviously you got to leave earlier. You can leave earlier. Like I said, this is being recorded. I'll forward the recording to Rob. So um, uh, the goal is not to write short. At some points in the presentation I'm about to share with you, it will feel like I am saying write shorter sentences. That's not it. The goal is to write sentences that are effective, where every word matters. Okay? Now, that does mean getting rid of the useless words, which we all write. But it also means making sure you're using good words that actually do as much as they possibly can. Okay, so uh, so uh, it's, those are sort of your two basic your your two basic goals here. The objective is not to so, so that's like the general advice, right? But the objective is to give you specific actionable things you can look for. So as you're editing your next novel, or even as you're writing. You you can you can say okay now I'm going to go through and I'm going to look for these kinds of words or these kinds of constructions oh yep I can tighten those up right rather than just the general advice use words that matter don't use extra words let me start with this basic uh, advice that we're going to come back to more than once you never want to lose track of your point of view why because what we're going to see is that your point of view determines what every word actually means okay. Your word means nothing objectively. It only means something in the point of view of the character who's who's experiencing or thinking the word or the narrator. All right. I actually, the original 45-minute presentation, which I think is the one Rob saw, had 10 commandments, but I think I have like 15 or something here. So <clears throat> my Moses Plus uh all right, here's a here's a first piece of advice. Hey, we have a uh we get rid of redundant adjectives. You just don't need them. Okay, plenty of things can just be a noun. Now, uh, first of all, super common um mistake. Uh this I think comes from the fact that English 
is technically arguably a pidgin, not a language, because an good Anglo-Saxon was adulterated with the uh, influx of French and then, you know, Latin and, and, and Celtic words and, and the Sanskrit words we stole and all that stuff, right? So English English rejoices in an abundant vocabulary. So lawyers deal with this, like, like in a contract, okay, negotiating a contract, and a lawyer will read a provision that says something like, I represent that there's that this conflict or this is this agreement does not conflict with any contracts. And the lawyer will say, hmm, what if it's not a contract? And we'll add a bunch of synonyms. Any contracts, deeds, indentures. Blah, 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 right? That's bad lawyering. It's also bad writing, and yet we do it, right? So look, rather than he was a big, hulking, muscular warrior, what's an example of something you could write? Yeah, that'd be more muscular. Mighty feud? Yeah. The mighty th yeah. yeah, get rid of all that. Try and find one, one adjective that kind of captures it all. Yeah. Or even simpler, you could just you could just pick one of those. You could say, "What do I read? What really captures it all?" Maybe hulking does it right. And and I'm not saying you need to slow down when you're writing your sentences. If you're writing fast in a hot fury, great. But when you come back and reread it, and you go and you read the sentence, you go, "Okay, what one of these do I need, or what could I use to replace all of them?" Okay. So um, another another thing we very commonly do is uh, is in Look, adjectives are useful when you introduce an object or a person. They help us visualize. You usually don't need them afterwards to describe that thing or that person again, right? Like if it's if it's a rocky hill, say that the first time. And unless you need to describe a rock or something, you don't keep calling it the rocky hill. Uh if if you write, if if you if you meet a character and he and he's a Bedouin and he's described as being short, okay. And then subsequently, you follow the short Bedouin down the hill. What what are you like like what is what what are you telling the reader? What does that mean if you keep repeating the adjective? That there are other Bedouins who might be taller. Yeah, it, you might you might legitimately do it if there's more than one kind of more than one Bedouin, right? There was a short, there was a tall one. There was the one with greasy fingers, right? And then like, uh, and then which one is it, right? And they all split up and they all go down the hill and I followed the short one. Absent something like that, there is only the one Bedouin. If you write the adjective short again, what are you, what are you telling the reader? Nothing. Not quite, not quite. You may be telling them something that you, that you don't intend to. What's going on in your character's point of view? They're judging them. They're, they're obsessing over the height of the Bedouin. Your character keeps noticing the height of the Bedouin, right? If so, if some reason you want your character to do that, fine, right? In fact, that's a subtle way, right? Rather than saying, he, she noticed once again the Bedouin was short. Just have her say a couple times, the short Bedouin, the short Bedouin. But, but don't say it just because that was the adjective you used in the first description. That's the point. So this sounds to me that it has to be under the influence of the rule of three. If you're going to do it subtly, you need to say short Bedouin three times before it becomes a pattern. Yeah, uh, arguably. Yeah, arguably. Here's, here's a commandment two of my 15 commandments. It turns out there are a whole bunch of adjectives that actually don't mean anything at all objectively. Okay. If you describe, this is a little counter to our, our common way of thinking about things. If you describe some character, all right, my protagonist sees some character and she is beautiful. What have I said objectively about the beautiful character? In fact, nothing. What have I actually said? That, your that character... Char that character finds that person attractive. Correct. That's it. That character finds that person attractive or weird or shocking or surprising or gross, right? So to be aware, and this kind of gets back to that first point. I mean, again, we're, we're kind of staying on the same point. 
your point of view defines the meaning of every word, right? These are examples of words. This is a there. There's this is just a a, a starter list because it's it's a it's it's not an exclusive or a comprehensive list um, that don't actually mean anything. They mean your protagonist finds them that way. So rather than say, "Oh, she was beautiful," right? Uh, the fairy queen on her throne was beautiful. What might you say? High cheeks, long, luscious hair. Um... Right, and then and then you're that's right. And describe and really, you want to describe what what your your character whose point of view you're in thinks is beautiful, right? But when you describe someone like that, we'll get the sense, you know, you communicate, you, you communicate uh, beauty. By the way, notice I'm not saying write a shorter sentence here, right? Your options are basically strike it and not refer to her beauty at all. You could have someone else say, you, you could describe people's reactions to her as beautiful or weird or frightening or whatever, right? Or you can describe the beauty or the fearfulness, but just... Be aware, there are a whole bunch of adjectives we use that actually don't mean anything objectively. Okay, here's, here's uh, so again, the goal is to give you like actual specific things to look for in your own prose. And my experience is the more you sort of notice these when you're editing, the more you start writing without them over time, right? So you require less editing. So ultimately, that's kind of the goal. Uh, modal verb. A modal verb is is, you know, can go, can is the modal verb, would go, should go, okay? Now, sometimes those mean something, okay? Uh, but sometimes they don't. <laughs> so, for example, what does Jim could see the door was open probably mean? The door was open. Yeah. Oh, very good. Uh, Jim saw the door was open, but if it's Jim's point of view, it just actually means the door was open, right? That's what it means. If we're in Jim's point of view, it just means the door was open. Or if you wanted to emphasize Jim seeing, right? Just Jim saw the door was open. Jim could see is interesting, maybe, if there's some reason to think that he wasn't able to see before or wouldn't be able to see, right? Like could see really is only useful if you want to emphasize his ability to see. Um, like so, if somebody else couldn't see that the door was open. Somebody else couldn't. Jack could not see the door was open, but Jim could. Right. Or, um, <clears throat> would, we do, we do similar things. Uh, we use would to create like a habitual past tense. Like I would go downtown and walk around. Right. Um, which uh, doesn't necessarily mean anything different from I went downtown and walked around, right? So uh, watch out. Uh, so watch out for modal verbs. Now, here are um, here is just a, again like a list of uh, some words that I find are highly deletable. <laughs> um so jim saw that the door would open could usually be jim saw the door was open or to to your point earlier just the door was open right absolutely uh what does some kind of a sword lay on the altar mean there was a sword on the altar yeah it just means a sword lay on the altar right it means the writer Kind of as as she was writing is like I don't know some kind of sword. Do, 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 do. It, either it can tell it's a sword or it can't. So it's a sword that lay on the altar, or it's a thing, and he has to go look at it. Right? It's not some kind of a sword. Um, one of the dwarfs probably usually is the same thing as a dwarf. Right? Um, wh when might it be useful for it to be one of the dwarfs? What what is one of the dwarfs? Tell us. 
if you have the others are doing something else yeah there's some kind of emphasis that like there's a group of dwarfs and this one is different right like uh, for example the dwarfs charged into the battle one of them came over to confer with the general right something like that is a, that's a great example um i like this one uh i see it a lot uh it, Clark bit the knuckles of his own hand. <laughs> now I want to write a character where that's an actual act, good sentence because usually he bites somebody else's knuckles. <laughs> that, that's, well, that's where it's useful is if, it, right? Is if you're like, okay, we're arm wrestling, right? And I want to make clear that he bite, bites his own hand, not the other guy's hand, right? Otherwise, you probably own, own could often just come right out. Um, very Mark Twain. There's a, a more famous comment by Mark Twain about editors. He says, "I find that I usually get the same value I get out of an editor by just deleting the word very out of my first draft." <laughs> um, and you can probably do without it throughout your manuscript. Is the truth. Um, all right. Uh. So this is, we're already kind of down this road a little bit, uh, right? Um, there are, uh, so so wh where this comes from for me is when Tony Weisskopf at Bain accepted my novel, Witchy Eye, she gave me exactly one comment. She said, it's too long. She didn't give me any prescription as to how I should shorten it. She said, it's got to be shorter. And it was 240,000 words long. And I looked at it and I said, I don't want to remove any plots and I don't want to remove any characters, but I bet I can just make it leaner. And I went through and I cut out 35,000 words without removing a single scene or plot or character. It was all like, it was all this. It was the subject. It was this stuff we're talking about today. Here's one of the things I realized. If it's clear who your point of view character is, you never have to say, that they're that they think something because everything on the page is what they think right so uh we've already talked about jim and the open door right but it, but if if i'm clearly in sarah's perspective and i write the question on the page where was he well, what does that mean it could only mean sarah thinks where where is he <laughs> right so <clears throat> there's a whole like class of the inner dialogue tags. You just don't need them as long as we're rooted in one person's clear perspective. Okay, the verb be is unavoidable. You're going to use the verb be in your novel unless you're writing some kind of stunt novel where you're like deliberately not using the verb to be to be clever, okay? But it's weak sauce. It is a copula. All it does is take two ideas and put them together without acting, adding very much information at all, except maybe a little bit of information about time. Okay? So you can often do better. So, for example, the bus stop was at the edge of town. All it says is there's a bus stop, edge of town, put them together. What kind of verbs might we use to indicate the bus stop's location at the edge of town that would tell us much better? much more interesting things about the bus stop. I or, think you have one there, right there. The bus stop slithered at the edge of town. <laughs> yes. Isn't that oh, awesome? Mark. Isn't that an awesome? <laughs> or, 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 or what about some of these others lurked? Like a bus yeah. stop that's slithering at the edge of town is a reptile. So there's something serpentine about it. It's casting off its skin. It's looking to bite you. A bus stop lurking at the edge of town wants to beat you up and take your money right like what a cool what an interesting bus stop a bus stop that is at the edge of town is just geography right you put in a, some other verb right the bus stop danced the bus stop loitered at the edge of town and like suddenly the whole neighborhood has flavor right um so i and on editing i look for i look for the verb to be and then say, well, can I replace this without looking too precious, without looking too dumb? Can I replace this and say something interesting, right? Um, German and Dutch are good at this, by the way. Uh, they often use the verb, like systematically, to lie or to stand rather than to be. 
So like the you don't see the book is on the table. We say it lies on the table, right? Or it's or it stands on the table. Um, and that just among other things, you know, a you're adding characterization, but also you're just mixing it up a little, right? You're not you reduce the amount of repetition in what you're writing. It strikes um, me that this is something that Raymond Chandler was really good at. I never really put the connection together, but as we we talk, as you said, lurked there. It's trying, that very much sounded to me like something that would be in a in a you know a Philip Marlowe novel. Yeah, lurking at the edge of Los Angeles, waiting to waiting to devour the young new actresses come to town from Kansas, looking to you know make make it in Sin City or whatever. Yeah. Um. So uh, the subject. So this is the, really the same point. The subjective compliment: she was X, he was Y. Is again just a. It's a very bland way to describe anything, right? So when you see it on the page, ask yourself: Can I say this without using the verb to be? Right. So he was taller than me. Is factual information. It's useful if you need to know who can reach the high shelf or who's gonna you know, jump for the, to start the ball, start, jump for the ball to start the basketball game. Right. Um, but, uh, but what could you say that's, that's just a little different. He loomed over me. Yeah. He loomed over me. Right. Absolutely. I stood in his As shadow. always, I looked up at Dave's tricorn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I could see into his nostrils. Right. Uh, I, 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 I stared into his sternum. Right. There's, there's all kinds of stuff you can say that's just not, it's just a, this just a little less plain, right? Uh, might also be funny or might add a note of like menace, right, uh, to the encounter. Um, the present progressive, again, uh, all, all of this, like hopefully one of the sort of recurring themes you're already taking is that there's sort of a rule of reason, right? It's like what works. And sometimes the thing that doesn't usually work will be the thing that matters, that, 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 that works in the situation. Present progressive is uh, is doing something, um, or or the past progressive is was, was doing something, right? Um, and uh, I see it a lot. Look, these, these, by the way, where did my 15 commandments come from? I edit a lot of books. <laughs> it's where they come from. Some are uh, some of this stuff are the things that I write in my own rough drafts, but they but they all come from somebody's rough draft, okay? And and really, I've seen them all more than once. So we have a tendency again. I think when we're writing fast, and I wouldn't say slow down. Do do the first draft fast, okay? That's great. But when you're going through, look for the ings. Right, Jim was looking through the front door. Really, me is really focused on the continuing ongoing process of Jim looking through the front door, right? Most of the time, Jim looked through the front door is going to be fine. When do you need to say Sally was standing in the corner or, or not need to, when might you want to have that past progressive or present progressive? When she's interrupted. Yeah. She's that's the classic the thing. When. Yeah. When you're, when you're comparing an ongoing process, that's the, pr the progressive was standing, was looking with a thing that happened, right? Outside of that, you probably not very often, right? Probably not very often. By oh. the way, you might have heard me talk about imperfect tense on the Discord channel. Imperfect tense is the Latin way to say past progressive or present progressive. So it's the same thing. Imperfect tense is just how I learned it. Yeah, I learned all my English grammar from like Greek and Latin and Hebrew, so I will also use weird terms. That's why I use examples in case I'm saying something that where my label is really wrong. <laughs> How often do you apply these? Because I've gotten back critiques that anytime you used any of these at all, I mean, literally people will blindly go through their what their manuscripts replacing every occurrence and any occurrence of it of these words at all are is verboten um that's such an interesting question uh at a high level i i feel a great degree of nihilism 
about um, the rules. But the reason is because I, uh, the grammarly curse. The reason is because I believe in art. So you're going to have to go struggle with your muse and figure it out. And and the, when I say I feel nihilism, what I mean is at the end of the day, it's going to work or it isn't. And and the truth is it won't work for every book, doesn't work for somebody, right? So you just kind of have to figure out where you want to where you want to strike that um, balance on all of these things and probably where you want to strike it will change over time so you'll do things in a novel that you publish in 2024 that in 2029 you would never do because your writing style has moved a little bit right um i i do not do mechanical search and replaces from from my point of view what i think i am recommending to you is hey Practice looking for these things as you read and as you reread and 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 it will help you sharpen your prose rather than search for the letters I N G. <laughs> now, now you could do that and it might it might it might work, right? That's just not what I would do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you guys might have heard me talk about the spice, my spice theory. That everything and everything that he's saying you can use, even though he says not to, but you have to recognize it's a spice, like you're putting in a chili. And if you put a lot of Carolina Reaper into your chili, that's probably you're, not the chili people are going to want to eat. And you're Whereas, not going to taste anything but the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> right. And it's going to drive, drive people away from it. On the other hand, if it's a red pepper kind of thing, on the assumption they're not allergic to red peppers, um, you can do it more often or jalapenos or all the way up the scale. And so that's how I look at it because there are absolutely times as Dave was talking about that you have to have the progressive going on. You have to, because that interruption of the action or that location or whatever is going on is relevant to the story. And without it, the story falls flat. And but we'll, we I, do look some of those... I go for it and look for it and, and highlight it every time I think it needs to be changed, but it's still up to the writer. Yeah, we tend to, we'll use some of the stuff sometimes when we want intentionally to slow something down or to give a little distance. As long yeah. as you have a reason, this is me as an editor, not Dave as an editor. But if you come <laughs> to me and say, I've got a reason for this being in there, even though I know it's technically wrong, I'm likely to say, okay, because you, you thought about the thing that you should think about and then made a conscious choice. I'm, I'm more nihilistic than that. I'll be like, here's what I would do. And if you're like, I make none of those changes. I'm like, well, I guess your novel is just going to be shit. Then your novel though, <laughs> do what you want. <laughs> Rob, great. I said, Rob, Sam, Sam, great question. Uh, I have a slide on that, but let me just tell you right now what I think the answer is. Yes, I do, except that deliberately letting some characters break some of these rules is a great way to give a character voice, right? So if somebody like uses present progressive, now again, you don't want to overdo it, right? But if someone uses present progressive or somebody um, just cannot help themselves and shoves modal verbs in, uh, uh, that's as good as having like a go-to adjective or having someone leave out articles or something, right? Like in an ideal world, in an ideal world, every, every piece of dialogue spoken by a character could only be spoken by that character, right? Because it comes out of what she cares about and how she says stuff. Now that's not how it really works, right? Sometimes someone's got to say the house is on fire and like their personality may not matter, Right. Um, but uh, but this is the, this is a tool like reversing this or, or or relaxing it a bit is a tool for creating character voice. Yeah. Awesome. But like you said right there, that's that's doing it intentionally. Yeah. Not right. just letting it go loose. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, we, have, we have like nine more of these to go. We got to get through the rest of our commandments. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and by the way, it's not just characters. So, so it's it's also cultures, right? Uh, so, um, uh, 
Yes. So in my Witchy War series, the characters, I try to have the characters have voices, but also I try to have the cultures have voices. And it's sort of, it's sort of cheeky of me because I'm basically trespassing um, on like all these other American cultures. But like, just as an example, the way my Appalachian characters versus my kind of Chesapeake plantation characters talk is pretty different. Uh, it's the, absolutely true that. Well, that's so, yeah, it is. That's right. So they have like a different rhetoric, right? So the 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 Appalachian characters tend to go for really colorful metaphors for everything, and the the sort of the 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 Chesapeake the the Cavaliers tend to have sort of a more developed, longer period sort of rhetorical style uh, that's got like a little bit of an Elizabethan ring to it, and and so that's true. It's not just that Bill talks that way, but so does Daniel Barkley, his nemesis, because they're they're both from John's land, right? So. So characters, yes, but also cultures, right? So, um, okay, uh, adverbs. Um, I would, I prefer every time a colorful verb to a verb plus an adverb. So I would say cackled over laugh with glee every time, and I would never say cackled gleefully. I think I think gleefully probably adds nothing uh, there. Um, you know, rather than say, no way, Jim said quickly, I would all, I always prefer, or almost always prefer to say blurted, right? Uh, spat out. There was, a, there's, it is funny. I, I, as a kid, some of you maybe also are old enough to know, to have noticed this, but at some point, like in the seventies, there was a vogue for using ejaculate as a dialogue tag. So or jet higher be like Joe ejaculated right and he's like and I was old enough when I was reading science fiction to be like this is really weird this is this is not a, and I get the Latin it just means throughout that's all it means right but like I guess I'm just recommending against ejaculate as a dialogue tag that's all I'm saying that that has had its day don't do that <laughs> so um okay so here's another thing that I, this is something that I do. Uh, I will tend to, because I'm, I'm writing fast, I write about usually kind of my standard pace is about a thousand words in an hour, which is like not mega fast, but reasonably quick. Okay. Um, and that usually involves some kind of staring out the window for part of that hour. Um, so like a really fast hour, like on fire might be significantly faster than that. But, but I'm writing fast enough that I will do this all the time. Right. Usually you don't need to say because okay, because in your head you're choreographing. Right. And that's good that you're choreographing. So you're like, OK, she's looking away from the window. So I need to say she turns and look out. Turns out you don't need to say turns, probably. Right. Uh, un unless there's some need to emphasize the actual fact of turning or something happens in the turn. Right. If you just say she looked out the window, you imply that that she turned her head or she turned and looked out the window. Similarly, right, if the sword's on the floor, you don't need to say he bent over to pick up the sword, right? <laughs> Unless his arms are six feet long, right? Uh, he bent over to pick up the sword. He or, or the sword from the floor. He's, yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. So you can pick more colorful words. I like it. Uh, right? So these are just examples, uh, right? So Jolene wanted water to drink. This is, this is an example of a necessary purpose clause, right? Uh, shoe leather, interesting. I didn't know that term, but that uh, makes all it makes sense. Like probably if Jolene wants water, right? Like unless there's unless there is also a fire, right? Uh, that right? Like like she probably wants it to drink. Um, or right. Jim went looking for a lighter, like it probably is clear from the scene. It's because he's got a cigarette or it's because he's trying to start a campfire. Right. All right. Um, so here is something, this is actually good. Now that we've got rid of Charlie, let me tell you the most important one. Here's the most important one, <laughs> but seriously, some variant of this, I see all the time and it drives me nuts, not nuts. Like I, Oh, this writer sucks, but like, 
we 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 improve so much when we when we do this okay we you need to learn to trust your reader trust your reader and especially around the idea uh, a couple couple things one uh, don't repeat you don't need to repeat stuff over and over and over again okay limited number of times even ones maybe okay but it, but especially this is what i see all the time is is writers hear the advice show don't tell and they interpret it as show then tell and so, and so so look here's my first sentence right a series of three toed footprints crossed the path from east to west the monster must have passed this way you don't need the second sentence right like that's what the first sentence means the reader will infer hey the footprints passed from east to west. The monster went from east to west. Unless this is like the a Scooby-Doo or a Hardy Boys episode and somebody's got monster footprints and is deliberately walking backwards to trick you which way they went, right? But they'll infer what you want, what you what you want them to see. You don't need the second sentence. Um, or uh or this, or this, right? I'm not even gonna read this out loud, it's too embarrassing. But but the point is, you know, look, in some in some genres, you might want a paragraph this long descri describing the longing that this guy feels, right? Most books you probably could stop somewhere before the end of this paragraph, right? Uh, but I I there are writers who I like who are wonderful, good human beings who will who will describe the thing, describe the reaction to the thing, describe the physical symptoms of the reaction, describe noticing the physical symptoms of the reaction, describe, you know, wiping the sweat off my brow and how I feel about wiping the sweat off my brow. And like the first thing was probably enough, right? Um, so trust your reader. That's the, that's the big thing. Trust your reader to get it. Okay. Uh, if you're repeating over and over again, you're, you're, you were just blocking your prose down. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> this this is the same point. That's why that's why it says continue to the top. So uh, trust your reader to recognize motives. Okay, you can. In fact, this is actually better. So there's a there's a book called. Oh, it's actually on my desk right now. Look at this. There is a book called. On writing in general and the short story in particular. This is a pretty good writing book, okay? By Rusty Hills or something. Rust Hills. One of the things Rust says in there is um, I think super, super insightful. And he says, look, we when we consider our own motives for why we do things, we don't always know why we do things. Right? We do something that we're like, why did I do that? That was stupid. Right? If your character's motives are always stated and obvious, you probably don't have a fully realized character. Like, it's the goal is not that every action should feel accurately motivated. The goal is that every action should feel real. That's not the same thing at all. Right? <laughs> the Hardy Boy. Awesome. Uh... So um, if you have given enough ground in the story, what happens in the story for your character to have motivation, you probably don't need to describe the motivation, right? Uh, you just have the character do it. And, and like, we know that he's getting revenge, right? Or we, or we know that he's, that he's lost control and, and is making a mistake, right? Or that he's greedy or whatever. Or he's desperate. Okay. It. So this first sentence is the good use of it. It is clear what it refers to. It refers to the jewel. Using it means we don't have to repeat the jewel. And if we said, she picked up the jewel, the gemstone felt cool and hard, that feels like we're trying too hard. Right. So it is a nice muscular way to talk about it. Right. Although, frankly, you could put these two together and say the jewel felt cool and hard in her hand. Right. And we would infer that she picked it up. So uh, 
sometimes it is just used to make the sentence more awkward. <laughs> like, it was fun to slide downhill. What's a shorter way to say that? Sliding down the hill was fun. That's it. You just added words to say right. it was fun, right? Helping wasn't hard, right? So uh, now again, like to Sam's point, right? Like maybe you have a character who talks like this and, uh, you know, su sufficiently frequently that we begin to recognize it as part of his voice. Um. It uh, is sometimes a dummy subject, like it took a few heartbeats for Jack to stand. It isn't actually anything in that sentence, right? It's, it's that Jack took a few heartbeats for Jack to stand. It's, it's really what's going on. Uh, Jack stood slowly, right? Jack's heart beat three times while he stood as he climbed to his feet. Um, and... Look, sometimes this is, you know, he, he was passionate, or, or this is just sort of a terrible sentence. It was clear that he was passionate. You, really, you want to sort of describe him doing something uh, that in that indicates the passion, right? Uh, the point here is is it. The, the appearance of it. You see the word it. The question is, does this refer to a clear thing, Right. If it does, maybe it's a, the right word to use. If it's a little ambiguous, um, or if it's, uh, or, or or if you're really just making the sentence awkward or longer, find a better way to say the sentence. Uh, unnecessary instruments. I like this first one. He snatched the magical sword with his hand. What is the alternative usually? He snatched the magical sword. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the better sentence, right? Unless your character has a prehensile tail, right? Like probably he just snatched the magical sword. In fact, unless there are two swords, right? It's probably just that he snatched. Or unless you want to emphasize he's thinking about the magic of the sword. He probably just snatched the sword. It's probably all you is probably all you need. Uh, you know, similarly, he struck the monster with his sword. Look, again, we choreograph, right? And so we're like, okay, the sword, the shield. If the guy's got a sword, one sword and like a shield and he hits the monster, it's the sword. He's not, if you don't specify, he's not hitting with his knee or head butting, right? It's the sword. Um, so, uh, that's true for instruments. Instruments, it's often true for objects, right? Uh, like if you say that two characters kiss and you don't specify what we assume is that they kiss on the lips, right? And context will tell you whether it's romantic or not. Uh, standing. <clears throat> What's the difference between I sat down at the table and I sat at the table? Turns out probably nothing, right? This is, now, by the way, this is awesome if you're a poet because it gives you flexibility in terms of meter. You have an optional syllable, sat down or sat. And you have an optional two ways to rhyme that, right? But if you're writing prose, like probably sat at the table is the more sort of punchy, straight, uh, uh, straight to the point, um, muscular way to say that. All right. Um, dialogue tags. Uh, they're okay. It's okay to have dialogue tags, but uh, I like to get rid of them where I can. I'm not merciless. I don't go around killing every dialogue tag. And, and I don't go around making sure every dialogue tag, you know, is a colorful verb, right? Um, but here are some thoughts. I think I might have a couple of three slides on this about, about dialogue tags and way to deal with them. If there are accompanying actions, okay, um, put the action in the same paragraph as the dialogue, 
and, and if in other words, if the action and the speaker are done by the same person, right? <clears throat> no period, Jim pointed his gun at the alien is very clear. Jim is the one who says no, and then he points his gun at the alien, right? Now, by the way, there's a corollary to this. I edited a book recently where I kind of had to point this out to the writer. And, and for this to work, you need to sort of keep your, di your, your paragraphs clean where the speaker does the action with her words in the paragraph. So you don't say like, no, Jim said, Sally then ran to the ladder, period. Jim yelled, look out in one paragraph. That's not one paragraph, that's three paragraphs right to to keep it clean so that when you say no period jim pointed his gun at the alien you know that it was jim right this is uh this is a place where you might have heard me talk about white space being the reader's friend i tend to look for every opportunity to provide a white space for my for everything i edit and write because it makes it easier for readers to read and if you put everybody's action into a sequence it may look choppy in some ways, but it's also faster to read and easier on the eyes. So it's something you want to do as a conscious choice. If you were going to mash it all into one paragraph, again, I like to say that that's a conscious choice and you need to have a reason for it. And and I'll 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 hit tons of paragraph spaces. Uh Dave's seen me add a bunch to his stuff too. And he he's as clean as just about anybody I've ever edited. Yeah. And in in big paragraph, this is like just on that same point, right? In a big paragraph, stuff in the middle tends to get lost because people tend to accelerate their reading when it's big paragraphs and they'll start read the first little bit and then their eye will jump down, even not intending to. So especially if you want something to be noticed, like put it on its own line or put it in a small paragraph, right? Or... Or, and I have done this, if you're writing a mystery and you want a clue to be something they have to find, I will stick it in the middle of a four or five or six line paragraph <laughs> and see if they're, if they're paying attention. That's funny. Um, oh, I think I, I guess I only have the one thing. Uh, oh, what else is on my slide here? Um, yeah, okay. Other circumstances where you can do without dialogue tags if you only have two speakers. Um, I like dialect. Some people say don't do dialect. I say do dialect. But here's the thing about dialect. Okay, because this is like just a this is a compressed version of a whole other conversation. Try this experiment sometime. Okay. Record yourself reading a paragraph and then write down phonetically what you are saying. OK, like like not don't don't just write down the paragraph you read. write down phonetically what it sounds like. And and you will find that you sound retarded on the page. If you do that, you, we all sound dumb. OK, so 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 you don't want to do a lot. Of like phonetically representing someone's dialect, you want to do a few things and, and you want to do it again. You can do it by culture, right? But you know, maybe you maybe you're alighting the H's in somebody's speech, or you're you're dropping the G's at the end of your looking and running, and they say looking and running, right? Um, basically, you sort of I think of it like an algorithm where you pick like no more than about three things for a character, and you be real consistent, or for a culture, and you be real consistent. And I love it. I do love it. You are creating a little more work for yourself in editing where you'd be like, oh, dang it. I forgot to have Calvin Calhoun drop his G's. I got I got to go through and look <laughs> uh, and and fix it all. So, all right. Dialogue text. Um, hey, this is Sam's point. Uh, dialogue, you, you don't want your characters to actually speak like natural human beings. Because natural human beings say uh a lot and they repeat they repeat themselves and they repeat the same words, right? You want the illusion, you want the illusion that they are that they that it's natural speech, but 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 you want it tighter. And and I think that muscular prose is actually a really good way to approach that. Okay. Um 
and and really that's all all of these rules hey use them on somebody am i saying things that are redundant am i saying something that doesn't mean anything except that you can deliberately choose to break some rules with 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 a character to give her a voice to give her a distinctive way um uh of talking there's a th now this is actually a thing i i've actually done as like a 90 minute class okay um so this is kind of a whole other point a character who just walks up and says what she is thinking sounds naive or dumb that's not how we do it as humans okay we say things to get what we want so one way to kind of uh, get to kind of get to a place where your dialogue does that is think of lines of 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 a conversation as an action scene and a line of dialogue is a p is an action to accomplish something. What am I trying to do when I say this? I'm trying to seduce him. What am I doing when I I'm trying to get her to reveal a secret? I'm trying to get him to back off, right? I'm trying to get him. What do I want when I say this? The answer should never be, or should very rarely be, I want to utter some piece of information that is convenient for the reader. <laughs> So just this is man, this is like writing advice at the highest level here. Okay. Conflict creates interest. Conflict doesn't have to be a punch in the face. Conflict can be the two guys who like each other and are working together, but they're also always doing this. Right. Or it can be two characters who are in love, but they're fighting over whose fault it was. Right. Or they disagree about where they're going to eat for dinner. Uh, right. Um, conflict if 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 look you shouldn't most of the time maybe always you shouldn't start the scene before there's conflict in it like with the conflict is the earliest that you uh that you come in on the scene when the conflict's over the scene's done you go somewhere else uh conflict creates interest, including in dialogue that's my point this isn't even a class about dialogue right this is a muscular prose this is like bonus we just had two classes in one look at that um, here is the, uh, here's the, here is the thing. Word order matters. It's jokes and, um, song lyrics and good tweets. Okay. Are, are writing forms, um, that, that really exhibit this point. Okay. The, in a joke or a good song lyric, the, first word should matter or if not the first by like word two or three something important needs to have been said why so that the listener is going oh okay you've got my attention right and and to keep the attention all the way to the end you need to have some 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 revelation waiting to come in with the last word right in, in in a joke, that's the punchline. You don't give the punch. If the punchline's in the middle of the joke, then the joke sucks, okay? Because people are like, oh, okay, I get the joke now, but like, okay, now you're still telling the joke, <laughs> right? The punchline, the funny word, the essential word's got to be the last one, okay? Your first word matters, your last word matters, right? This isn't about adding or subtracting words. It's about the order. So look, this first, this first three lines here, this is Shel Silverstein right? As recorded by Johnny Cash. Just look at the lyric. The first phrase, the first two words are my daddy. Okay. It's hard to think of words that are more resonant for everybody for totally different reasons, right? You had a daddy or you didn't. You have, maybe you had a father and you wished you had a daddy. Maybe you look down on people who had a daddy rather than a father, right? Like that is a word that has a bunch of meaning. My daddy left home. Oh, crisis. Right? And and cliffhanger. Did he come back? What happened? Why did daddy leave home? You're, you're, you're asked a cliffhanger. The nature of a cliffhanger is that it is, it's just a question asked where the reader now sticks around because she wants to hear the answer. My daddy left home. All kinds of questions. When I was three, okay, this is starting to sound bad. This is sounding like abandonment. Dad didn't go to get Thai food and come back. 
daddy went for cigarettes to the corner and I haven't seen him since, right? That's the kind of story we're talking about here. He didn't leave much to my mom and me. Oof, now we're getting a picture, right? It's 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 the abandonment. It's the kid. He's a solitary kid, not even the consolations of brothers and sisters, right? He was left he was left alone with mom, right? So his dad abandoned this wom a woman and a child, except this old guitar. Now, by the way, why why is that why is that evocative? What's this guy doing? Now we're, <clears throat> now we're talking the uh, traveling music musician. Well, we're talking the the well, if it's, it's in a country song, it's it's a country trope in and of itself. It's a trope. It's a singer singing yeah. it right now with a yeah, guitar. It, with his dad's guitar, he held on to the guitar. This guy's an adult. When he was three, he got left his guitar. And so as wounded as he is, and as upset as he is, he's still got the guitar. Right? Except this old guitar. Oh, and here we go. And an empty bottle of booze. Right? Man, first word matters. Last word matters, right? My word. booze. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, uh, look. So the point is, you got to hook them up front, make something happen. Look, I. Th this is this is like the kind of advice that you could that scales to every fractal level, right? So you go in my novel. Do I need to hook people up front? And hold on to them to the end. Yes, I do. In the chapter, do I need to hook them up front? Hold them up. Yes, I do. In the paragraph, in the scene, in the paragraph, in the sentence, a strong sentence hooks them up front and holds on to the end. Now, I know that feels like, wow, Dave, you're saying, look at every one of my sentences. Well, I kind of am. But also, what I'm saying is, as you're reading and you feel like oh, this feels a little weak or something, one of the questions is, Oh, am I hooking people and holding on? To, oh, mate, right. So uh, uh, I, I'm not saying interrogate every single sentence in your 100,000 word manuscript, but I am saying be aware this is a thing that will tighten up a sentence and make it punchier. And, and so when you are struggling to get the effect you want with your prose, think about this as a possibility. And here is commandment 15. Look, I said 90 minutes, but like 60, 60. We went, we went at triple speed. Um, anything else that adds nothing, anything that is redundant, um, anything that is that is meaningless, uh, anything that is that is uh self-indulgent, you showing off, just get rid of it. I think that's the whole presentation. That's it. Okay. Um Questions, objections. Dave, you are wrong. You must do some other thing instead. I can take it. Obviously, you've created this rule or the, these commandments, these rules to make suggestions for what we should remove. Um, but as you Not said, Not necessarily it, remove, right? Sometimes just change, change or okay. even add. So it should change, but it can change your voice. So I might have a character who wouldn't use daddy, well, since we're on this page, um, and would use father or da or something else. And obviously that's going to change the way that this person speaks throughout. So my question is, how do you make sure that you're consistent enough? where it doesn't throw someone out. What does that mean you're consistent enough? Do you mean that you consistently have that character say the same things? Or Imagine you if I'm like, doing it from their point of view. How much do I need to layer that in to my narrator voice? And do you just have one point of view? Depends. It depends on the work. So I tend to write, I tend to write in a fairly close third person point of view, which means that the, uh, and you, and usually with more than one point of view, which means that the same way the character speaks a little bit softened will tend to appear in the narration. Right. So, uh, we got a character named Calvin Calhoun, who is a cattle rustler. 
uh, from Nashville in, in Wichii. And he has a sort of a characteristic phrase, which is whenever he's about to do something, he kind of has slightly regrets about, he'll say, Lord hates a man as doesn't or as can't, whatever it is, the thing he's about to do. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, Lord, Lord hates a man as can't spend money on his friends. Lord hates a man as doesn't know when it's the right time to dance. Right. And so I'll put that in the in the in the narration as well, as a reminder that we are we are in Calvin's point of view, and and that is a way to express reaction rather than saying he decided he would do X. Um, so uh, and uh, other examples. So uh, when I'm in so character so characters people not just characters humans have multiple names. So I will choose uh, deliberately to have um, a character referred to by different names, depending on who's talking to them, right? Someone will call call a character Bad Bill, but the same character gets called Captain Lee or General by other people, okay? And, uh, and I will do that in in dialogue so this is a way to identify who's speaking right if only one person calls him william only only kathy filmer ever calls him william then the line william comma something something we immediately know it's kathy right um but also in kathy's point of view i'll refer to him as william i will absolutely do that um and i think that um i think that that hooks your readers and tends to make the narration disappear. Now, if you are worried about how do I keep characters straight, the answer might be you uh, you write things down, you be deliberate about it, and you have a little reminder. You're like, okay, I'm now writing a scene in Kathy's point of view. What do I need to do? Okay, uh, she needs to refer to Bill as William. She needs to do this, that, the other thing. Okay, go, right? And maybe in your working space, you've got like a little half sheet for each character written out, hanging on the wall to remind you, you know, when Obadiah is talking or when, you know, Jacob Hope is uh, the point of view character. Um, but yeah, you you choose it on purpose. Um, or if you invent it as spontaneously as you're going, fine, write it down uh, so that you can so that you can repeat it. And don't be afraid to backfill. Um, my, uh, my writing style tends to be discovery. I, I learned so much about the characters as I'm going through and I will routinely leave myself notes when I come across something that, oh, I just said something, uh, uh, I have a character that says my mama's son won't do this or my mama's son ain't that stupid or something like that. Right. It prefaces things with my mama's son. Well, when I stumbled upon doing that, I, I think I wrote a message. I use XX as my identifier. XX, make sure he says it once in every in every speaking time, because now it's that's his pet phrase. But I didn't start that character by going, he's going to say, my mama's son does this. I, I went and backfilled it. Also, if you're going to write mysteries or you want to hide something, backfilling is a great way to make sure that there's the trail of breadcrumbs you want at the time you want because you don't always know what that is when you're writing until you see it at least I, at least i don't yeah now the, the 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 limitation of backfilling is it's tricky to do it in book two of a series so so <clears throat> this is something in your book one that's worth thinking about right did I give everyone a distinctive, sufficiently distinctive way of speaking? Or, or did I give everyone a clear motivation? They give everyone something that they want that's going to carry us through the series, right? I didn't create any characters that are just there to like hold the spear and uh, say some lines that I'm going to want them to have real motivations later, right? Um because it's uh, it's 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 better, it's stronger if if they have those from the beginning. Yeah. Does that honestly? I got a question. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to jump in. Go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, does that Anna? Did we get to your 
question. Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out the level, and I think softening it slightly, yeah. but still keeping it there is important. The Possibly. problem with asking me a question like that is I've already told you I'm a nihilist, so it's like, I don't know, man. This is what I, I said. I said my thing. You go try and write a book now. It's kind of my only answer. Right. Sam, what, did, what was your comment? This is actually for uh, for both you and Rob, um, as the, experience, the, the more experienced authors here. Um, you've talked about some of the techniques of editing. Uh, I'm starting to pay attention to time. How much time am I putting into my editing as well as into my writing? You mentioned about a thousand words an hour uh, for your writing. Uh, I'm a little bit less than that. But I'm also trying to get a handle on how much time do I spend editing. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, for that that thousand words an hour, how much time do you expect to spend editing? So it's it's so interesting. Uh, I spend uh, let's think about this. Um, I spend more time writing than editing. That is probably that's probably fair to say. Um, I write fairly clean. Some of that is I've been writing long enough that I tend to write pretty kind of good prose the first time. Uh, this is this is not the question you asked, but may be useful as you're thinking about it. So um, what I like to do, although it relies on me sort of having a significant chunk of time to write every day, and that's not always true, right? Sometimes I'm writing a little bit now and then and going three months without writing and then like trying to write on an airplane and write. What I like to do is edit what I wrote yesterday and then write today's writing. And that that usually helps me get in the right mood. It also helps me kind of avoid um, consistency and copy edit kind of mistakes because I don't forget the names of the characters from yesterday. And I tend to also sp spot things. I'll keep a running folder that says, oh, don't forget you need to... Um, this is this, it's backfill mostly. Don't forget you need to go add something Right, a little more detail in chapter 12 about the jewel crusted hilt of the sword, or you need to add, we need to go back earlier and plant <clears throat> why George hates Landon, right? Um, st stuff like that. I find that very useful. I find if I do that, my end product at the end of the first draft is a lot cleaner. So I guess I'm not saying how much time, but like when the editing is done, right? Uh, I find I get a much better first draft than than if I just power through the first draft. Now, sometimes I power through the first draft. Sometimes I'm co-writing and I only write half the first draft and the other guy writes the other half, right? Um, but that's how I ideally like to work, Sam. I think I get the best results that way. That's good. I have two, personally, I have two to three threads of writing going on at a time. And it entirely has to do with um, where I am actually in a given, at, during the day. So for example, what, what Dave was talking about was called churning. And that's, let's say I write a thousand words yesterday or today, tomorrow I'll rewrite those thousand words. I'll probably turn that into 1500 because I find out all the things that, that overnight sort of generated my brain oh i need this here or i'll notice i need a dialogue tag even though I, you know because i tend to be slim with them in the first kind or or what about this action here that's really cool or whatever and then i'll write another thousand words or however many it comes out and so i'm ending up at 1500 to, to 2000 or 3000 in a day but some of that is rewriting and cleaning up all the things i did the day before that's two of the threads is rewriting and writing rewriting so that I can write as since I'm often a pantser, I often need to rewrite so that I have the next chunk stronger in my head. But I have a third thread that's going on pretty much throughout. And that is what I call bedding. And what that really is, is I routinely send my work in progress to my phone 
and I read in bed. And as I see issues with what I've written, I will, I, I send it to my Kindle and in your Kindle, you can edit. So for me, a lot of my editing happens there. And one of the joys about this is it doesn't, there are a lot of different ways you can physically edit. Like this is totally a physical editing, the, the, the entirely the medium and the way you do it. You, you should not edit solely in the same way you write in the sense if you're writing on, let's say you're writing on a word document, like I do all the time, I should not solely edit just reading that same screen because my eyes will miss things simply by virtue of the fact it's the same layout. It's the same, same image. So on my phone, it's a significantly smaller amount of text. So I'm reading maybe essentially a paragraph or two at a time. Things jump out. Plus it's a different way of looking at it physically. I'm looking at the small amount as opposed to the screen. It's closer to my eyes because I, I read like this and I have everything there and it works. This is also why printing something off and reading it from a printed copy makes a, such a huge difference because it's a different way of your eyes looking at something. And if you read it out loud, that's yet another way because you're, you, when you read to read, you read to read. When you read to speak it aloud, you are consciously making sure you you go over every word. And that latter part is brilliant for two things, especially that I find. And one of them is, I just used the word forbid three times in three consecutive paragraphs that I didn't notice. But if I said forbid, 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 then all of a sudden my voice is like, well, wait a second, I've just literally said these words. I physically know I have maybe I should clear that out or do it intentionally and emphasize it one way or the other, but I have to deal with it. Uh, the second thing is, and this is something I'm really bad about, especially on my first draft, double especially if I'm doing a sprint. Definite articles, indefinite articles, these little words, they may or may not show up. There's a 50-50 shot. Let's roll the dice. Do I put the the in there or do I not put the the in there? Or is the A anywhere in the... You never know. But when you read it out loud, you catch those. Um, some people have taken to having their computer read it out loud, um, which also has its benefits for much the same reason. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. So, so what I, the, the end result of this, I'm sorry to say, is find your own things that work for you to change your view of your document enough so that when you read it, you're having your eyes are physically having to look at it in a different way, at least for me, bedding, putting it on my Kindle on my phone, reading it in bed until two or three o'clock in the morning or whatever, because I'm stupid that way and and adding notes. And then when I go to add the when I go to put them into the document, I also get the advantage of well, I was thinking about it last night. I'm reseeing it now. And then all of a sudden I get the creative process for me, which is tends to be collab collaborative with myself often enough. I was like, Oh, this was, Oh, but I could do this, this, and this. And all of a sudden I've got a new, new thread. And suddenly it may not, it may just be fixing a typo. It may mean a whole new plot thread as a pantser. I never know what's going to happen. The characters are going to tell me what, the, what they want to do. And, and I'm not in control. Uh, especially when I'm going through the editing process. <coughs> Thank you, guys. That's, that's just me. Again, um, I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize something we've said before, and Larry Korea emphasizes this all the time. Everything we're saying, doing is great for us. If it ain't working for you. Find the ways that work for you to get words on the page. The editing stuff matters. I mean, that, that stuff matters for everybody. But if you know how to make it work, if you know how to make imperfect tense be your standard way to go and it, it works for your prose, I don't know how, but every get, get things on the page. We can fix things that are on the page, but I can't edit a blank page. Hmm. And I think it's just that this is just a matter of experience. 
um, of the value of an editor is your editor may say, I think it's too much. And then you go, hmm, okay, that's a, I need to consider it. Do I also think it's too much? Or do I tell the editor to pound, pound sand here? Right. Um, you and I had that instance, this, this last story with the, with the way you had the dialogue tags arranged on the sentences. Rob really wanted me to have dialogue tags in front of some speech and I didn't care. So I said, fine. And accepted his changes. <laughs> I could have thought, but I did yeah. not. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, but we talked about it. I, I pointed out a, a, what I thought was a, for lack of a better term, a tell or a, a, a trend. And we talked about it and, you know, if he'd have said, I don't want to do it this way. I really want to do it this way. I've been fine. As long as you're making the conscious choice as an editor, I don't usually care as long as you're making a conscious choice to do it. Um, there are a few instances where I do care. I have, I have one time where, um, and when I do care, they have, they have some sort of scientific thing behind it. Uh, case in point, um, the rule of three is a human thing that almost every one of us unconsciously deals with. And it basically boils down to this. If you haven't heard it, you should look it up. Uh, but it basically boils down to this. If you say a word, great, it's a word. If you say it twice, it looks dumb. Because why did you repeat it? We, we just heard this word. If you say it three times intentionally, it is a pattern. And if you choose to do two things, you've, you've, you've made things kind of, well, is it a pattern or not to the reader? And they kind of get off kilter. But if you make it three times, it works. If you make it one time, it works. If you make it two, there's, there's no resolution to that question. And so that's one of the few times where I, I tend to be pretty, either change the word or add it again, one way or the other. Now, sometimes the, the, re, the, the writer says no and, and tells me to pound sand, and that, that's acceptable. But it's one of the few things I'll fight about because that's a human trait, a psychological trait we know exists. Like there's tons of evidence, and it happens in all sorts of mediums. It's not just, it's not just um, writing. But it, it, rule of three is really embedded into um, our brains. Did that completely go around your question, Sam? Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> okay. Well... Shall I stop the recording? Sure, unless you have any other advice that you want to give us. Why? Well, I, 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 yes, but not tonight. But not tonight. <laughs> I'm just going to say what I just said. Write lots of bad sentences because bad sentences can be edited and non-existent perfect sentences are pretty darn useless. That is true. That's true. That's true of non-existent perfect manuscripts too. This was my. I had more than one friend. After which I come out, came out, tell me. You know, you wrote a pretty good book, but if I wrote an epic fantasy novel, it'd be like this and that and that. And like nice, so write it, dipshit, because I don't care about your imaginary epic fantasy novel whose idea in your head explains why I did it wrong. None of I them mean, have still written their epic fan. No, actually, one has, but hasn't published. So, like, most of them have not written it. All of you have done one of the most crucial steps of a writer. It's 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 its own skill, and it is possibly the single most important skill. You've said, "I'm willing to turn this over to somebody." It's done. I'm willing to turn it over. Completing a project. You've sent it off to an editor and, you know, whether the editor says no or yes, or whether it gets published or not, the ability to say a story is done is crucial. How many of us know, we talk about, hey, I'm a writer, and somebody goes, yeah, I've been writing on something for 15 years. That's nice. <laughs>
I mean, that's nice. Go for it. Now, now finish it. So you guys have all done that. And that's something you should recognize as something you should be proud of and do it again. It's not easy because I will tell you, every time I send off a manuscript, um, I'm like, it's ready to send. All I have to do is hit the mouse button. Ugh. And yeah. then I send it. I mean, it, there's always it, there's always that that I'm not good enough and all those things and and what did I screw up and how many mistakes have I made? Oh, they think I'm an idiot. You guys probably think I'm an idiot anyway, but sending it off is a risk. You're putting your baby out there. You're putting your heart out there to get get chopped at. But if you do it, you've got a chance of success. And if you don't, you don't. Sorry, that's my finish it rant. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'm going to, on that note, end the recording.